Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon X using only Fairy-type Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. So, at long last, I've gotten around to doing a monotype challenge in Generation 6. I've only played through these games once, and that was when they were first released. But I remember really loving my casual playthrough of the game. They're notoriously easy, sure, but I think that the art style in this game makes Kalos feel unlike any other Pokemon region. There's so much detail put into the route designs, there's a lot of different ways to interact with the environment, and it's really cool to see places in the game that are inspired by real places in France. There's a lot to like about the Kalos region, and one of the selling points in these games was the introduction of a new type for the first time since Generation 2, in the form of the Fairy type. I can't say that it'd be my first choice for a new type, but it did give dragon types a much needed nerf, and it also gave a lot of boring Pokemon some pretty cool buffs. Kalos also started the trend of having a very extensive regional dex even before the Elite Four, so there are quite a bit of fairy type Pokemon that we'll be able to catch in this challenge. However, a few of them are exclusively found in the same routes as other encounters, so with Nuzlocke rules, it will cut down our total numbers of encounters by just a few Pokemon but it was still really fun to get to use a lot of Pokemon that I don't use very often. Now, before we get into this fairy type challenge, I wanna give a very quick shout out to the sponsors of this video. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, and video editing. As recurring viewers know, Skillshare has been a sponsor of this channel in the past, and it's because I genuinely think that they offer really great classes that will help you take the next step in your creative journey, whatever that may be. I consistently refer back to Jordy Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class, which is where I learned literally everything I know about editing my videos. Like Jordy's class, all Skillshare classes are optimized to put your learning first. There's no commitment, no timeline, you can skip individual lessons if you're not interested, and all classes are ad-free, which really is the absolute best way to consume any type of media. So, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare's premium membership so that you can explore your creativity for free. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the challenge. Just as a quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Also, I won't be using Mega Evolution or Pokemon Ami. And as a final note, in the interest of full transparency, I want to let you know at the start of the challenge that I completely messed up recording the footage for the final fight against the champion. That's probably the worst possible recording to lose, and I didn't realize I wasn't recording until the game auto-saved, so I couldn't even go back and try to re-record it. I want to let you know at the start of the challenge so that it doesn't seem like I'm trying to bury my mistake at the end of the video. The only thing I can do is say that I'm really sorry and reassure you that I've implemented a backup recording program so that this hopefully doesn't ever happen again. I hope you still enjoy the rest of the challenge video though, and if you do stick around to the end, I do my best to recreate the battle the only way I know how, with elementary school level arts and crafts. Anyways, without further ado, let's see how this goes. Our story begins by meeting up with my rivals. In X and Y, you have not one, not two, not three, but four different rivals. There's Girl 1, Girl B, Totoro, and Coconut Head. My posse also asks me for a nickname, so having just finished my PhD in real life, I insist that they call me Dr. Flygon, as is legally required. Instead of getting my starter from Kalos' old geezer of a professor, it's actually my posse of rivals who offer me my starter. Since none of them are fairy types though, it doesn't really matter. I randomly choose Chespin and give him an incredibly clever nickname, and then we're off. Fortunately, there isn't much I have to do with chess poop before I can get to Route 3 and find an Azuril, who will be the run's official starter. Prior to this generation, Azuril was normal type, which never really made much sense to me since it evolves into the water type Pokemon Meryl. So you'd think that it would have made sense to make Azuril a pure fairy type, such that it evolves into the water fairy type Meryl, but I guess not. Normal fairy it is. I name our new Azuril Boat. This is probably the dumbest nickname theme I've ever done. Fortunately, Boat has the ability Huge Power, which doubles her attack stat. She also has 31 attack IVs, because baby Pokemon in Pokemon X and Y are guaranteed to have at least 3 perfect IVs when caught in the wild. This is actually true for all Pokemon in the Undiscovered Egg group, which primarily includes Legendaries and Mythicals, but also includes the baby Pokemon, 
unknown, and also Nidorina and Nidoqueen. Anyways, basically Boat with her 31 attack IV and huge power is going to be an absolute monster. Or should I say she could have been an absolute monster had I not immediately accidentally run into a trainer who demolishes me with a level 6 Bidoof. Oops. Okay, well in attempt 2, I catch another huge power Azuril, and this one is even better, because somehow he has 4 perfect IVs, including attack. This time, I make sure to not run into the Bidoof trainer, and after carefully leveling up Boat on some crappy Pokemon, as well as running back and forth for a few minutes, Boat evolves into Meryl. This needed to happen before we hit level 11, because Meryl learns Rollout at level 10. And with Rollout, we're able to easily demolish the first gym leader Viola and her bug types. She leads with a Surskit, who uses Bubble, as I use Defense Curl. Defense Curl doubles the damage of Rollout, so on the next turn, a single Rollout is enough to kill the Surskit. Then Vivillon comes out, but thanks to its times 4 weakness to Rock, and Rollout doubling in power on consecutive turns, a single Rollout is more than enough to knock it out in one shot, winning us a very easy first gym badge. From here, there's a huge chunk of the game before we get to the second gym, as indicated by the massive jump in the level cap. Just north of Santa Loon City, we get a second encounter on Route 4. Both Ralts and Flabebe can be found on Route 4. Flabebe is far more common than Ralts. However, Flabebe can also be caught a little bit later in the game. So if we delay this encounter and get Flabebe before the Route 4 encounter, we would guarantee Ralts with the Species Clause. So I decide to just skip this encounter for now, which leads me directly to Professor Sycamore's lab in Lumio City. So I go talk to this old guy. Oh. My. That is a gorgeous man. Wow. Well, um, in Game Freak's thinly veiled attempt to cater to Gen 1 nostalgia, Professor Sexymore challenges me to a battle using all three of the Kanto starters. But he doesn't really stand much of a chance against Boat. I take out his Bulbasaur with two returns, as it just does a little bit of damage with Tackle. Squirtle is second, which means two more returns knock it out, as it just uses Water Gun. Last is Charmander, who does actually manage to outspeed Boat and hit a Growl, but two returns finish it off as well. After that, Sycamore offers me one of the three losers that I just beat to a pulp. None of them are fairy types though, so I just pick Charmander, give it another clever nickname, and then dump him in the box. From here, Rival Girl 1 and I head to one of Lumio City's many cafes where we meet Lysander, who, spoiler alert, is the evil big bad of the Kalos region. If his insane haircut didn't give it away, then any single line of dialogue from this psychopath should be a pretty clear indication that this man needs some serious help. Men will literally try to create a global extinction event instead of going to therapy. Anyways, we also meet Diantha, the Kalos champion. I can't wait to fight her. That battle will be truly spectacular. After this, Boat evolves into Azumarill, which is a pretty great Pokemon to have this early in the game. Then we have to go to Parfum Palace, which is so intricately detailed for absolutely no reason whatsoever. This is a great example of why Kalos is so cool. Parfum Palace is obviously a fictional depiction of the Palace of Versailles, and having actually been to the Palace of Versailles since the first time that I played these games, the resemblance and the attention to detail is really cool, especially the massive courtyard in the back with hedge mazes. I really don't think that any other Pokemon game has had this much aesthetic detail in it. Well, anyways, after watching some fireworks, during the daytime, we get the Poke Flute, which means that we can go wake up the Snorlow blocking the path on Route 7. So now finally, I can get my second encounter. On Route 7, in Pokemon X, you can catch either Flabebe or Sorlex. I'm hoping for Flabebe, given that I have no way to evolve Sorlex since it's a trade evolution. Fortunately, Flabebe does have the higher encounter rate, and I run into it first. I name her Carnivali, and she joins the team. With a Flabebe caught, this also allows me to head back to Route 4 and find the 5% Ralts encounter. It does take a while, but eventually I catch her, and name her equally. The nice thing about Pokemon X and Y is that the new EXP share mechanics mean that I can just continue on with the story and all my Pokemon in my party will level up. So pretty soon, Carnivali evolves into Floet. I also make my way to Glittering Cave and find a Mawile. A Steel type is going to be incredibly useful, as it acts as a great counter to Poison type moves, which Fairy types are otherwise pretty weak to. This Mawile also has Intimidate, all around a great encounter. I name her Justy. All that's left to do is train my new encounters up to the level cap. I try to do this quickly by using the EXP share while taking on the Silage City Gym Trainers, but in order to do that I have to box Boat since he gets to the level cap of 25. Rising Star Manon has a Lunatone and a Soul Rock. Surely, I thought to myself, there's nothing that these Rock Psychic types can do to Justy, who resists both Rock and Psychic type moves, and also knows Bite. Well, it turns out Soul Rock and Lunatone both know Psy Wave, 
which is a move that does a random amount of damage up to 1.5 times the level of the user. In the case of Solrock and Lunatone, that's 33 damage. So without Boat, this Solrock Psy waves through my entire team, and I white out. As usual, I consider a whiteout to be a wipe, despite technically still having one Pokemon in the PC. So that's a reset, and a pretty embarrassing one at that. Not as embarrassing as wiping to a level 6 Bidoof, but still pretty embarrassing. What happens next is two straight hours of failed attempts. A lot of these failed attempts are intentional resets when I find a thick fat Azuril, because I figure that there's really no point in doing the first part of the run without getting a huge power Azuril. On attempt 5, I finally manage to find another huge power Azuril, but after a small stint of training, I accidentally run into preschooler Oliver, and even though I am able to beat his fearsome Caterpie, I run out of water gun PP. So his level 4 Azuril has me beat. This must be what rock bottom feels like. Okay, fast forward to attempt 9, and I finally get another huge power Azuril. This time, I am able to successfully evolve Boat into Meryl and beat the first gym leader. But then I lose the battle to the perfect male specimen in a lab coat. His Bulbasaur used a Leech Seed this time instead of Tackle for whatever reason, so Boat number 9 didn't stand a chance. But we all know the famous French saying, C'est la vie. In English, that roughly translates to, life do be like that sometimes, so we just gotta keep going. On attempt 11, I catch another huge power Azuril, and this time we destroy Sycamore, primarily because he just doesn't use Leech Seed with Bulbasaur. So finally, the run is alive. It doesn't take too long to get back to the point where we wiped. I managed to catch all the same four encounters, and fortunately, Justy has Intimidate again. This time, I also make sure to evolve equally into Curlia so that she's not completely useless. From here, I'm able to safely level up everyone to the level cap, not wipe to the random gym trainer, and then take on Grant, the second gym leader. I can't believe we're still only at the second gym leader. Okay, Grant leads with an Amara, which is very cute, but also very weak to fighting type moves. He starts with the Thunder Wave, which pays off instantly as Boat gets fully paralyzed. On the next turn, Amara uses Aurora Beam, which you'll notice is not very effective to Boat. The Gen 6 AI is pretty bad. Rock Smash leaves Amara with a sliver. So, Grant uses a Hyper Potion, but thanks to the defense drop from the previous Rock Smash, one more Rock Smash just knocks it out. Tyrant comes out second. He hits a stomp as we get paralyzed, but as you can see, Boat is pretty tanky. It does take a few turns as Tyrant goes for the classic Para Flinch combo, but eventually we break through with a second Rock Smash, which crits Tyrant and it gets knocked out. With that, we've got our second Gym Badge. From here, we get a few more encounters. On Route 10, I catch a Snubble. You can also catch an Eevee on this route, which does evolve into Sylveon, but even if I found Eevee first, I wouldn't have caught it, because I don't really want to deal with Pokemon Ami, which you have to use to evolve Eevee into Sylveon. Pokemon Ami can give your Pokemon all sorts of game-breaking buffs, so I just decided to leave it alone. I name our new Snubble Cuisini. Cuisini unfortunately has the ability Run Away instead of Intimidate, which is a bit disappointing. Runaway will turn into Quick Feet when he evolves, which is like Guts, but for speed. So it's much, much worse, especially because Gramble is still pretty slow even with a plus one speed boost. East of Geosenge Town on Route 11, I catch Kalos' Pika clone, Daydane. I name her Pixie, and now we've got a full team of six. With some training, Cuisini evolves into Gramble. And then we head to Reflection Cave, the home of the one and only rightful king of Kalos, Carbink. Carbink is a phenomenal Pokemon, and after having one on my team during my first playthrough of Ultra Sun, I can't wait to use him again. Well, that sucks. Okay, fine, I'll catch the freaking Mime Jr. But just so you know, you're going straight to the box, because I will never, ever, ever put you on the team. Here's a fun fact, in Pokemon X and Y, about 90% of random trainers' Pokemon will just have their level up movesets. But for whatever reason, certain trainers just don't. So Black Belt Igor Sock knows Bulldoze, which crit kills Justy. That's a really bad death considering that Justy is my only Pokemon not weak to poison, which is a pretty common type amongst the members of Team Flare. But, c'est la vie. Welcome to the team in play E. Just know that the second I get another team member, you're getting the boot. Up next is a whole bunch of Mega Evolution stuff. Totoro gives me a weird rock, and then Karina's grandpa asks where I got it from. I try to lie and say that I found it myself, but he won't let me lie. It is good to know that Totoro's got my back though. Total bro, that guy. Before the next gym, Girl Rival 1 wants a battle. She leads Meowstic, and I lead Cuisini. Meowstic flinches me with a fake out. 
Then she goes for a weak disarming voice, says I use bite, which knocks it out in one shot. Then Absol comes out. It hits a slash, and I retaliate with a headbutt. Even a crit won't kill me, so I stay in to tank another slash, and then knock it out with a second headbutt. Last is Brakeson, so I switch to Pixie, who gets hit by a Psybeam. I go for a Nuzzle to paralyze, and then Brakeson hits a Fire Spin. Then I go for a Parabolic Charge, which thankfully crits because I gain enough health back to tank a critical hit Fire Spin. Then I use Volt Switch to switch into Equally, who by the way evolved into Gardevoir. A Confusion finishes off the Brakeson, winning us the battle. Risking Pixie to that critical hit was pretty sloppy though. Because I haven't played these games much, it's a lot harder for me to predict what's coming and plan ahead. I can look up move sets and generally see what's coming, but without the experience of playing through the games over and over again, I'm missing that extra bit of intuition that helps me play safer, and in my opinion, better. So just keep that in mind going forward here. Next is Karina with her fighting types. She leads Mianfu, and I lead Pixie. Mianfu goes for a fake out, which procs my rocky helmet, but makes me flinch. On the next turn, I use Charm, and then Mianfu uses Double Slap, which procs my rocky helmet twice. Then I go for a Parabolic Charge, which leaves Mianfu with a sliver. Then she misses a Double Slap, which actually would have killed her thanks to the Rocky Helmet. So Mianfu heals with a Hyper Potion as I go for another Parabolic Charge. A final Parabolic Charge, plus Rocky Helmet damage from Double Slap, knocks out Mianfu, and Pixie stays at almost full health. Machoke comes out next, so I use Charm. Machoke then uses Rock Tomb, which crits and lowers my speed. So I switch to Carnivali, who gets hit by another Rock Tomb. I'm playing this battle a little slower than I have to because there's a pretty scary Halucha waiting in the back. Machoke uses Leer as I set up a Wish. Then Machoke goes for a Power Up Punch as I hit a Fairy Wind and Wish restores me to full health. Machoke goes for another Leer as I use Wish again. Then I switch to Pixie who gets hit by another Leer from Machoke and then Wish heals me back up to full health. A Parabolic Charge leaves Machoke with a Sliver as he retaliates with a Rock Tomb. So I switch back to Carnivali as Karina heals. Then I hit a Fairy Wind, which crits to leave Machoke with a Sliver, and Machoke uses Rock Tomb. Then Machoke uses Leer, and I use Wish. So I do one more switch to Pixie, who gets hit by a Leer, and then gets back to full health with the Wish. So finally, I've positioned everything correctly. A Parabolic Charge finishes off Machoke, and then Halucha comes out. She outspeeds and sets up a Hone Claws, but then Pixie retaliates with a strong Parabolic Charge. Halucha does a little bit of damage with Flying Press on the next turn, but with a final Parabolic Charge, we knock it out, winning us the third Gym Badge. After this, we meet Karina at the top of the Tower of Mastery. She forces us to fight her using just a Lucario, which is unfortunately not a fairy type. So we lose the challenge. It can't be done, so I guess that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or, or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. Have I killed the joke yet? Okay, obviously I have to make an exception here. For what it's worth, we kick the snot out of her Lucario. She then offers me the Lucario that I just fought with. I tell her no, thinking that she'll force me to take it, but she doesn't, so the Lucario just sits there. I feel kind of bad, actually. But you know what gets my spirits up? Riding on a Skiddo. It is so freaking fun. I could ride this Skiddo for hours. I know that we get to ride Pokemon in Alola and the Let's Go games, but nothing makes me feel as alive as I do on top of a Skiddo. Kalos is by far the best region. At this point, I decide to make Implay E a full-fledged member of the team and level him up. He evolves into Mr. Mime, which is a very, very good Pokemon thanks to Encore and its other utility moves. I also get a Shiny Stone and evolve Carnivali into Florges, which is a pretty run-defining Pokemon. Thanks to its insane special bulk and access to Wish and Protect, it makes pretty much any special attacker completely obsolete. If you can get a Florges in your Nuzlocke, I'd highly, highly recommend it. Before taking on the next gym leader, Rival Girl 1 challenges us right outside the gym. At least she had the courtesy to call me before so I wasn't totally bamboozled, but this is still pretty annoying, because we literally just did this before the last gym. We'll just skip this fight. Now it's time to take on Ramos and his grass types. Without Justy the Mawile though, I don't have any grass resists, nor do I have any real plan here. He leads Jump Pluff, and I lead Pixie. I immediately start with a Nuzzle as Jump Pluff uses Leech Seed. Then I go for a Charm as Jump Pluff uses Acrobatics and gets some HP back with Leech Seed. Then I use Volt Switch to switch to In Play E, who gets hit by an Acrobatics as Leftovers heals us to a nice amount of HP. Then I set up a Substitute, which Jump Pluff breaks with an Acrobatics. Must have been a high roll. So I set up another Substitute, and then Jump Pluff gets fully paralyzed. 
Then I hit jump left with a Psy Beam, which leaves it in the red, but an Acrobatics isn't enough to break the sub this time. So on the next turn, Ramos heals, and I hit another Psy Beam. Then a second Psy Beam leaves jump left in the red as an Acrobatics breaks in play E sub. So I set up another one as Ramos uses his second Hyper Potion. Then it's another round of Psy Beam and Acrobatics. But my sub is still up, so I can get another Psy Beam off, which actually manages to confuse Jump Pluff, who hits himself in confusion. So a final Psy Beam knocks out the Jump Pluff, and we've still got our sub intact, and Ramos is out of Hyper Potions. Go Goat comes out next, which makes no sense to me because Weepin Bell has a way to hit us for super effective damage, but whatever. I use Infestation on the Go Goat as he breaks my sub with Takedown. From here, I do some substitute stalling as Infestation and recoil damage from Takedown whittle down the Go Goat's HP. It's pretty cheeky to use Substitute in this way, but none of my other Pokemon have very good defense other than Boat, so this is kind of a tough Pokemon to fight. Once I can't make another Substitute, I switch to Equally, who gets hit by a Bulldoze. This lowers my speed, which I might have forgotten, because I go for Calm Mind for some reason as I take a huge chunk of damage from Takedown. Another one will just straight up kill me, so I gotta switch to Pixie, who tanks a Takedown, and then gets a bunch of health back with an Orenberry and his Cheek Pouch ability. Then I have this huge brain fart moment and forget that Go-Goat knows Bulldoze, so I use Parabolic Charge. Go-Goat retaliates with a Bulldoze, but somehow Pixie survives. Thankfully there was no crit, so I'm not punished. With the Bulldoze speed drop, I'm not outspeeding though, so I gotta switch to Carnivali, who gets hit by another Bulldoze. The Go-Goat then hits a strong takedown, but we actually would have survived even if it crit because crits only do 1.5 times damage in later gens. The takedown also procs Carnivali's rocky helmet, so Go Goat goes down, and Carnivali gets to set up a wish for free. Last is Weepin' Bell, so I switch to Quizini, who gets hit with a super effective acid, but thankfully it doesn't crit, and wish heals him back up to almost full health. On the next turn, I use Bite. I went for Bite here instead of Headbutt, because I was hoping for a flinch, but then I instantly realized how stupid that was, since Headbutt also flinches and has more base power. But regardless, Quizini finishes off the Weepin' Bell with another headbutt, winning us an incredibly sloppy 4th gym badge. From here, it's a very quick turnaround to the 5th gym leader in Lumio City. But before that, I make sure to explore the city a bit, which is probably the coolest city in all of Pokémon, but also the most infuriating city in all of Pokémon, since the 3D controls through the city kind of suck. There's a lot of fun stuff packed into this fictionalized version of Paris, though. I find a clothing store that tells me I'm too ugly to shop in it, I get to go to Lumio City's version of the Louvre, which is again insanely detailed for no reason whatsoever. Although this little child seems to have a piece of art hanging up in this version of the Louvre, so either that kid is an art prodigy, or the Pokemon world has much lower art standards. Either way, this is a pretty cool place to explore. In a hotel, I find a not-so-subtle confirmation of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and I also find a waiter drinking water out of a potted plant. And then there's this lady, who's really into how thick this marble pillar is. So yeah, that's Lumio City. Honestly, other than the smell of urine, it's not much different than actual Paris. Anyways, time to fight against Clement and his electric types. And so my plan here is to set up Trick Room and then switch to Cuisini, but it ends up not working at all. Emolja uses Aerial Ace as I set up a substitute. I'm hoping that it uses Volt Switch, but it just uses Aerial Ace again as I set up another substitute. So I set up a Trick Room on the next turn as Emolja uses Quick Attack for some reason. So my substitute stays intact. Another quick attack breaks my sub, and I get off a Psybeam. Then I switch to Pixie as Clement uses a Hyper Potion. Emolja uses another quick attack as I use Volt Switch to bring in In Play E. Then I switch back into Pixie, who gets hit by another quick attack, and then Trick Room expires. I then go for a Parabolic Charge, but Emolja hangs on with a Sliver, so he gets off an Aerial Ace. Clement heals again as I go for a Volt Switch, so I switch to In Play E. Then I switch back to Pixie one last time. And then finally, a final Volt Switch lets me kill the Emolja and bring in Carnivali safely. You may have thought that that was all really confusing and a lot of pivoting for no reason, but I needed to position it just right so that I can safely deal with the Magneton that comes out next. It knows Mirror Shot and has the ability Sturdy, so it's a real pain to deal with. Basically, what I need to do here is stall Magneton out of Mirror Shots. Fortunately, because I was able to get Carnivali in without taking damage, this is relatively easy to do with Wish, Protect, and Leftovers, so long as Magneton doesn't get several consecutive critical hits. It also helps that Mirror Shot isn't perfectly accurate, and that Magneton also likes to set up Electric Train. Once Magneton is out of Mirror Shots, I start using Magical Leaf, but it turns out that Thunderbolt still hits pretty darn hard thanks to the Electric Terrain. So eventually I get to the point where I'm risking a crit. 
so I switch to Pixie, who ends up getting hit much harder than I was expecting. A critical hit Thunderbolt definitely would have just killed him. That's like the third major battle in a row where I've accidentally risked Pixie to a critical hit. She's one lucky mouse. A combination of Orenberry, Cheek Pouch, and Carnivali's Wish get Pixie back to full health. So I go for a Parabolic Charge, which does a huge chunk of damage thanks to the Electric Terrain. A Volt Switch definitely would have just killed it. So I take a huge chunk from Thunderbolt, and then a Volt Switch on the next turn finishes off the Magneton. This allows me to bring in Quizzini as Heliolisk comes out. Heliolisk outspeeds and uses Thunderbolt, and then this weird glitch happens where it does all my damage instantly instead of slowly draining my HP bar. I guess my very real Nintendo 3DS must be acting up or something. In the moment though, it scared the crap out of me, because I thought that I had accidentally messed up and Quizzini was for some reason not actually at full health or something. But that wasn't the case, so he lives and fires off a Bulldoze, which leaves Heliolisk in the red. Even with the speed drop from Bulldoze though, we aren't outspeeding it, so I have to switch to Equally, who tanks a Thunderbolt on the switch. And then finally, she retaliates with a Confusion, knocking out the Heliolisk and winning us yet another sloppy gym badge. The later half of this game goes pretty quickly, so there's another fight with Girl Rival 1, which I'll skip, and then I get to go down this slide. Whee! That was fun! Now it's time for the sixth gym leader, Valerie and her... Pff, fairy types. She leads a Mawile, RIP, but it doesn't actually know any steel type moves, so I lead Boat. Mawile uses Iron Defense. Okay, so I guess technically she does have one steel move, but after that I use Bulldoze. Thanks to the Iron Defense, Bulldoze doesn't do much, but thanks to the Speed Drop, Boat now outspeeds, so she hits another Bulldoze, which leaves Mawile in the red. Then Mawile retaliates with a very cute crunch. Valerie uses a Hyper Potion, but then Boat crits a Bulldoze, putting an end to all of this nonsense. Second is Mr. Mime. She sets up a light screen, but Boat doesn't care. Bulldoze is for days. Mr. Mime still outspeeds and hits a Psychic on the second turn, but then Boat knocks it out with a second Bulldoze. Sylveon is last for Valerie, and she starts with a Charm. And then I use my sixth Bulldoze in a row for just a little bit of damage. Then I switch to Carnivali, who tanks a Dazzling Gleam. From here, I slowly take out the Sylveon with Fairy Wind, while also staying healthy with Wish and Protect if I need it. It does take a little while, because Carnivali has very weak moves right now, but right after this fight, I'll get the TM for Dazzling Gleam, and I'll also get access to the Move Relearner to teach a few of my Pokémon Moonblast, so I'll finally have some strong Fairy-type moves. Eventually, I get to the point where another Fairy Wind won't kill Sylveon, but it will get her into the red, and then Valerie will heal. So in order to avoid that, I just switch to Equally, and then kill it with the Psychic on the next turn. And that's the 6th Gym Badge. After this, there's some Team Flare stuff, but it's all skippable for now. I also finally get another encounter. From Route 15, I catch a Klefki and name her Tickety. She has the ability Prankster, and again gives our team some useful resistances with her Steel type. She replaces in Play E, who goes back to his rightful place in the Box of Shame. Hey, remember how Girl Rival 1 challenged me right in front of the entrance to the 4th gym? Well, she does it again here. Only this time, I was just walking past the gym, trying to explore the city. I'm not even really that close to the gym. There's a good three squares between me and the entrance of the gym. So I'm not prepared for this fight at all. She leads Meowstic, and I lead Tickety. So I immediately switch to Carnivali, who gets hit by a fake out. Then Meowstic hits a Shadow Ball as I fire back with a Moon Blast. Then Meowstic hits another Shadow Ball, which drops my special defense as I go for a Wish. That was kind of dumb. I tank another Shadow Ball, and then knock out the Meowstic with a Moon Blast. I get back a bunch of health with Wish, but second is Delphox, and thanks to the special defense drop, I can't stay in. So I switch to Boat, but Psychic hits really hard. And thanks to Hail damage, Boat is now in critical hit range. So I have to switch back to Carnivali, who gets hit by a critical hit Psychic. Good thing I didn't stay in. But that sucks because now Carnivali can't do anything. I protect because I might as well get some Hail chip damage on this thing. And then I switch to Equally, who tanks a Psychic. On the next turn, Delphox hits a very strong flamethrower, and then Equally retaliates with a pretty underwhelming, not very effective Moon Blast. If it isn't clear yet, this is not going well. From here, I switch to Pixie, who tanks a Psychic that would have killed if it crit. But thankfully it didn't, because I really didn't have any other play here. Then I use Volt Switch, which, as it always does, leaves Delphox in the red. Delphox is now in Blaze range, so I kind of have to just switch to Boat and pray that Delphox doesn't crit. Fortunately, she doesn't, so Boat hangs on with a sliver. But now I gotta switch again, this time to Quizzini, who tanks a Psychic, which mercifully also doesn't crit. 
Hail Damage does manage to finish off the Delphox, but now my team is in shambles and Jolteon comes out. This thing can outspeed and kill basically every single one of my team members at their current health. So this is looking really, really bad. Tickety can't tank two discharges, and even if it could, I can't one-shot it. So I need to make a sack here. And as much as it pains me to say this, I have another Psychic Fairy type in the box. So equally is the right choice for the sack. So I bring her in. And then for some reason, Jolteon goes for Quick Attack. So equally survives. Okay, well then maybe it'll just Quick Attack again. So I switch to Tickety, and it uses Discharge. Well, that's bad. But with a Discharge low roll, it's possible that Tickety survives this. So I go for a Dazzling Gleam, and then Discharge knocks out Tickety. That's two Steel Fairy types down the drain. But we have more pressing matters to deal with. Namely, this Jolteon is about to wipe my entire team. My only hope here is to send out Carnivali and pray that for some dumb reason, my dipshit rival uses Quick Attack instead of Discharge. And that is exactly what happens. She does it first into a Protect as I just get some hail damage, and then she does it again as I set up a Wish. So I can use Protect on the next turn, and then Wish heals me back to over half health. My rival completely threw this fight. I mean, look at how much damage Discharge does to Carnivali a few turns later. That 100% should have been a wipe. And it's only by the grace of terrible AI that Attempt 11 is still alive and well. Things could still be bad here if Jolteon manages to paralyze me with Discharge, but for some reason it just goes for Double Kick. Maybe it's out of Discharges? I wasn't counting, but I don't, I don't think so. Either way, a Moonblast knocks it out. And last is Absol, but Carnivali outspeeds and easily knocks it out with a Moonblast, winning us the battle. Well, in comparison to what we just experienced, Olympia and her Psychic types are a total cakewalk. She leads Sigalith, so I lead Pixie. I hit it with a Nuzzle, and then she instantly gets fully paralyzed. Then I use Volt Switch, which, surprise surprise, leaves Sigalith with a sliver. So I bring out in Play E, who has weaseled her way back onto the team yet again. Sigalith also gets fully paralyzed again. Olympia then uses a Hyper Potion, and I set up a Substitute. Then I go for a Thunderbolt, which leaves Sigalith with a sliver as it uses Light Screen. So Olympia uses another Hyper Potion, but then I lock her into Light Screen with Encore. I actually don't want to kill her with the Light Screen still set up, so I stall out the Light Screen by just going for Psychic. Once the Light Screen expires a few turns later, I just kill it with a Thunderbolt. Then Meowstic comes out. A quick Google tells me that Fake Out won't flinch me behind the sub, so I just go for an Encore but then I actually do flinch, so I just assumed that Google was wrong. But then I learned that Google is not wrong, and that actually this Meowstic has Infiltrator, so it can just bypass my substitute. And I get hit very hard with a Shadow Ball. Fortunately though, it doesn't crit, so in play E survives to live another day. And he also gets off an Encore. So I switch to Carnivali, who tanks a Shadow Ball. Another Shadow Ball doesn't do much, as I just hit a hard Moon Blast. Then I go for a Wish, which was probably a little greedy, since Shadow Ball could lower my special defense. But it ends up working out, because I knock out the Meowstic on the next turn, and I get healed back up to full health. Last is Slowking. I just go for a Moon Blast, which lowers Slowking's special attack. It then goes for a Calm Mind. On the next turn, I go for another Moon Blast, as Slowking hits a pretty hard critical hit Psychic. But one more Moon Blast is enough to knock out the Slowking, winning us the 7th Gym Badge. Before taking on the final Gym Leader, we've got to complete all the Team Flare storyline stuff. Some of the Team Flare leaders are actually pretty difficult thanks to our relatively poor defensive bulk and their tendency to use Poison-type Pokémon, but since I don't lose any Pokémon in those battles, we'll just skip them. We also have to fight Lysander three times almost back to back to back. We'll go ahead and just skip the first two times though, which leads us to our confrontation with a very skinny blue cow. As far as I know, you can't not catch this thing. If you kill it, the battle just starts over. So I just thwonk my Master Ball at it. Technically, Xerneas is a fairy type, but it's also a legendary, which I choose not to use in my challenge runs, so it just goes in the box. Then it's time for our final fight against Lysander. He leads me and Xiao, and I lead equally. Now, it's my understanding based on calculations that we outspeed me and Xiao here, but the trainer document that I use doesn't actually show the natures of other trainers' Pokémon. I don't know if the natures are random or if they're just not included in this trainer doc for some reason, but I do know that natures are determined differently based on the game. So who knows? Either way, this Mianxiao clearly has a plus speed nature, so it outspeeds equally, meaning that I gotta risk a high roll crit on the second turn. Which sucks. Fortunately, I go unpunished, and a Moonblast knocks out the Mianxiao. Honscrow comes out second, but it also goes down to a Moonblast. 
Third is Pyroar, so I switch to Carnivoli, who tanks a Fire Blast. Then I just use Wish and Protect until Pyroar is out of Fire Blast PP. And after that, I set up Calm Mind, which I got as a TM for defeating Olivia. Since this setup takes a while, I guess at this point I'll just address something that I've seen in a couple of comments on a few of my videos that has bothered me. Some viewers seem to think that using certain strategies like Toxic Stall or Substituting Calm Mind or presumably Wish Stalling are dumb or boring and they shouldn't be used in a Nuzlocke video. While that is a perfectly valid opinion to have, I don't particularly agree with it. And in a lot of cases, those strategies are the only viable way to beat a challenge or at least the only viable way to beat a challenge without having to avoid bad RNG. And while it might be more exciting as a viewer to watch someone gamble on dodging a critical hit or using more dynamic strategies, you have to keep in mind that every time I gamble on a critical hit, I'm also gambling a tremendous amount of my time and energy. It takes a very long time to make these videos, and if I have to reset a challenge because I tried to gamble on a more exciting but less reliable strategy and it went poorly, it's very possible that I would have to delay the release of a video by a week or more. I would much rather use a tried and true strategy like Toxic Stall or Calm Mind Setup that I know works if it means that I don't have to restart the challenge from the very beginning. And being negative about using those types of strategies in the comment sections of people's videos is not only mentally deflating and exhausting for content creators, but it also encourages content creators to resort to manipulative and shady things like using save states to avoid bad RNG. So bottom line, you don't have to watch my videos if you don't like the way I play. Believe it or not, I do these challenges because they're fun for me. And coming up with how to get off the perfect toxic stall or calm mind setup is still really fun for me. Even if you don't find it as thrilling as me risking everything on dodging a critical hit, hopefully you at least understand where I'm coming from, and hopefully you can appreciate that I pour dozens and dozens of hours into a single video when it's all said and done. If you still disagree, and you don't like my playstyle, that is a perfectly okay opinion to have. But just remember that opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one, and you don't need to show yours to strangers on the internet. Anyways, once I'm fully set up, a Moonblast finishes off the Pyroar. And last for Lysander is his Gyarados. But the way that Mega Evolution works in Gen 6 is that the Mega Evolution starts at the beginning of the turn, but on that turn, the Pokémon still uses the speed stat of its base form when attacking. So, Lysander's Gyarados Mega Evolves into this big shrimp or something, but Carnivali still outspeeds him. And with Mega Gyarados's Dark type, it gets a big fat fairy type weakness, allowing us to knock it out with a single Moonblast, winning us the battle, and saving the world. All in a day's work. Okay, with that we can make our way to Snowbell City and take on the 8th Gym Leader. There's a few fights with relatively important characters here, including a fight with Sycamore that surprised me out of nowhere, and also a gauntlet against the three B-tier rivals that aren't girl rival 1, but they're all pretty easy. So we'll just skip them and jump straight to getting our final encounter of the run, a Jigglypuff from Route 20. I name her Transport, and she has the ability Competitive, which is pretty cool, but unfortunately she's just gonna sit in the box. Our team is pretty solid as is. Finally, it's time for the last gym leader, Wolfric and his ice types. He leads Abomasnow and I lead Pixie. I go for a Nuzzle to paralyze him, and then Abomasnow retaliates with an Ice Beam, which freezes Pixie. So I switch to in play E as Abomasnow gets fully paralyzed. Then I use Confide to lower his special attack. After two Confides, it's clear that Abomasnow is now just going for Ice Shards, his only physical move. So I switch to Carnivali. Then I start setting up Calm Minds and using Wish to stay healthy, but you can just skip this setup with a Fade to Black. Once the Calm Minds are set up, I kill Abomasnow with a Moonblast, then Cryagonal comes out. I go for a Moonblast, but the Cryagonal outspeeds and hits Carnivali with a Confuse Ray. Fortunately, we hit through and kill the Cryagonal, but then Avalug comes out, and it knows Euro Ball. So if Carnivali hits herself in Confusion, Euro Ball could kill her. So I gotta switch to Boat. Unfortunately, Avalug uses Curse on the switch. I go for a Brick Break, but Avalug tanks it, and then uses another Curse. This is starting to get a little scary. I go for another Brick Break, and then Avalug goes for another Curse, so now it's at plus 3 attack and plus 3 defense. Retrospectively, this was very bad positioning on my part. I could go for a Brick Break and hope to crit before Avalug kills Boat, or I could switch to one of my special attackers and hope that he's greedy and goes for another curse on the turn that I switch. I decide to gamble on the fact that Mankind is greedy, so I switch to Equally. 
Fortunately, I'm right, and Wolfric goes for another curse. So on the next turn, Equally just kills the Avalog with a Moonblast, and that's badge number eight. Last up is the Elite Four. But before that, I have to go through Victory Road. And before that, I have to actually get to Victory Road, which puts me in the crosshairs of Ace Trainer Muriel on Route 21. Ace Trainer Muriel has a Crustal, which knows Shell Smash, a move that doubles attack, special attack, and speed at the expense of lowering defense and special defense. This Crustal also knows Rock Wrecker, which is a Rock-type Jija Impact. In my haste to get to the Elite Four, I am completely unprepared for this, and Crustal just straight up murders Carnivali in the blink of an eye. The worst part about this is that not only is Ace Trainer Muriel an avoidable trainer on Route 21, Route 21 in its entirety is completely avoidable. You can just access Victory Road by backtracking to Santa Loon City and using Route 22. The strongest trainer on Route 22 has a level 31 Lucario. So this was across the board, completely moronic on my part. So much for wish and calm mind setup, I guess. The Elite Four just got significantly harder. Rest well, Carnivali. Well, Victory Road also has its fair share of battles that are pretty difficult, but in the interest of time, let's just jump straight to the Elite Four. Here's my final team, leveled up to level 65 to match the aces of each of the Elite Four members. My team members will gain a few levels during the Elite Four thanks to the EXP share, but that's okay according to my personal rule set. I've also brought on Transport, who has evolved into a Wigglytuff to replace our dearly departed Carnivali. Alright, let's see if we've got what it takes. I start with the easiest of the four first, Drasna and her dragon types. She leads Dragalogy and I lead Quizini. We're able to outspeed and knock out the Dragalogy with an expert belt boosted earthquake. Next is Altaria. She starts with a Cotton Guard, so Quizini's play rough doesn't kill. On the next turn though, Altaria just misses a Sing, so a second play rough knocks it out. Third is Noivern, so I switch to Pixie who tanks an Air Slash. Then Noivern uses Flamethrower, which does burn me, but a Citrus Berry and Cheek Pouch bring me back to full health. Then I paralyze it with Nuzzle. Then I Volt Switch into Equally, who gets hit by a weak Flamethrower. A Moonblast knocks out the Noivern on the next turn. Last for Drasna is Drudagon, but a single Moonblast knocks it out. The crit wasn't necessary there, but it sure was fun. That's one Elite Four member down. Next up is Seabold and his Water Types. So now it's time for some fun Baton Pass strats. Seabold leads Klawitzer, and I lead Equally. I get off a Confide and tank a Water Pulse. I keep doing this until I'm in range to a critical hit, which happens to also be the same turn I get confused. So then I switch to Boat, and then I just start using Confide again. Equally got off three Confides, so Boat just whispers three more dirty secrets into Klawitzer's ear holes or whatever shrimp have, and then I switch to Implay-E, and then I set up a substitute as Klawitzer just keeps doing baby damage with minus six Water Pulse, and then I set up a Calm Mind. I really only need one Calm Mind, but I decide to go for a few until the substitute fades because I want the substitute to be as full as possible in case things go wrong later. After the sub fades a few turns later, I set up another one. Then I baton pass to give Pixie the substitute and the calm mind boosts. From here, it's four Thunderbolts to one shot every single one of Seabold's Pokemon. I thought that Starmie might outspeed Pixie, which is why I wanted to substitute in case Starmie crits a surf, but the Starmie doesn't even outspeed us, so we win the battle with our adorable little substitute still on the field. That's two down. Third is Malva, the Fire-type trainer. She leads Pyroar, and I lead in play E, who I've taught a few new TMs to. Pyroar uses Hyper Voice, which in play E is immune to thanks to his soundproof ability. Then in play E sets up a Trick Room. Then I baton pass to Boat, who's now primed for a Trick Room sweep. But then the Pyroar uses Noble Roar, which is really stupid because thanks to soundproof, that wouldn't have affected in play E either. But because of the attack drop from Noble Roar, we can no longer sweep with Boat. So I switch back to Inplay E, who dodges another Noble Roar. Then I use Encore to lock Pyroar into Noble Roar so that I can reverse my own Trick Room safely. Then I protect on the last turn of Pyroar's Encore. And then I set up Trick Room again, as Pyroar for some reason just uses Noble Roar again. Clearly the AI is just not equipped to handle soundproof. So I baton pass back to Azumarill, but this idiot just uses Noble Roar again. So I hit it with a Waterfall, but it leaves it with a Sliver. And then the dummy uses Flamethrower instead of Hyper Voice. I'm not really sure what's going on with the AI here. But I decide to switch back to Inplay E and try to set up Trick Room one more time. Malva heals with the Full Restore. Then I use Encore to lock Pyroar into Flamethrower so that this dummy doesn't keep using Noble Roar. 
Trick Room expires, so I set it up one last time as I take just a little bit of damage with Flamethrower. Then I baton pass to Boat. I do have to risk getting burned here, but thankfully Flamethrower doesn't burn. So now finally, I'm able to knock out the Pyroar with a Waterfall. Then Talonflame comes out, which would normally be a huge problem because it has Brave Bird and Flare Blitz. But because we're under Trick Room, I outspeed and kill it with a single Waterfall. Third is Torkoal, who actually does outspeed me in Trick Room, but it just goes for Curse. And this Torkoal is actually the whole reason I kept Surf on Boat, because it just one-shots Torkoal. Chandelure is last for Malva, and now that Trick Room has expired, it's gonna outspeed me. I don't want to switch into a Confuse Ray though, so I decide to just risk the high roll critical hit Shadow Ball, but it just goes for Flamethrower. So a Waterfall knocks out Chandelure, winning us the battle. Three down, one to go. But the last Elite Four member is Wickstrom, who uses Steel types, which can give our fairies a lot of problems. He leads Klefki, RIP, and I lead Pixie. Klefki has Prankster, so he's able to outspeed and set up a layer of spikes as I hit a Thunderbolt. On the next turn though, I just outspeed and knock out the Klefki with a second Thunderbolt. Pixie baits Probopass second, who would normally be a huge problem because he has Sturdy and knows Flash Cannon. But now that Pixie's out, I can break Sturdy with Volt Switch and bring in Quizzini, who tanks the Earth Power baited by Pixie. Then Probopass just goes down to an Earthquake on the next turn. Third is Caesar, who does have Technician Bullet Punch, which can do a lot of damage. But Quizzini is holding a Babiri Berry so that even a crit won't kill him. Caesar doesn't even go for a Bullet Punch though, so a Flamethrower knocks out the Caesar in one shot. So last for Wilkstrom is Aegislash. And with this guy, it's all about playing around King's Shield. I start with a Protect, but then Aegislash goes for a King's Shield as well. So I gotta switch to Boat as Aegislash stance changes and hits a very hard Iron Head. I go for a Waterfall, but then Aegislash uses King's Shield, so Boat's attack gets lowered. Then I go for a Protect as Aegislash switches back into Blade form. Now things get a little scary. It's very likely that Aegislash just uses King's Shield here to return to Shield form, but if it doesn't, a Waterfall won't kill him thanks to the attack drop and then Aegislash would be able to retaliate and kill Boat. So instead, I could switch to Transport. If Aegislash uses King Shield, then we're in the clear. But if it doesn't, and it chooses to use Iron Head, we could be in trouble. Transport also has a Babiri Berry, but a crit would kill him. So I gotta risk it. I switch to Transport, and Aegislash goes for a King Shield. Phew. Okay, so on the next turn, I go for a Protect, as Aegislash switches into Blade form and tries to hit another Iron Head. Then on the next turn, a flamethrower just knocks it out before it can get an attack off. That wins us the battle, and with that, we've defeated the Elite Four. The only thing that's left is the champion Diantha, but in case you skipped the intro of this video, no judgment if you did, my recording got messed up during the championship battle and I don't actually have that footage. Nor do I have a way to easily go back to that point and try to recreate that footage. So instead, I will just do my very best to reenact this final fight using my incredible artistic skills. Diantha leads Halucha, and for the last time, I lead Pixie. Halucha outspeeds, but it just sets up a sword stance, and then Pixie knocks it out with a Zap Plate boosted Thunderbolt. This baits Tyrantrum out next, and unfortunately, this thing will do far too much damage to anything that I could switch in. So after surviving so many critical hits, it's time to bid farewell to our spunky little mouse. After getting off a nuzzle, Tyrantrum just knocks out Pixie with a head smash. Rest well, buddy. After this, I bring out Equally, who revenge kills Tyrantrum with a single Moonblast. Equally baits out Gorgeist, so then I bring in Transport, who gets hit with a Trick or Treat. This does give Transport the Ghost type, but thanks to her normal typing, Gorgeist can only use Seed Bomb, which does a little chunk of damage to Transport, but then Transport claps back with an Expert Belt boosted Flamethrower, knocking out the Gorgeist in one shot. Aurorus comes out fourth for Diantha and Aurorus is Diantha's exploitable weak link. It has Blizzard, Thunder, Light Screen, and Reflect. So just 10 total PP for attacking moves. I start by Thunder Waving the Aurorus with Transport. Then I just start using Confide to lower her special attack and Protect to stall out Blizzard PP. Eventually, Transport goes down to a Blizzard, but not before telling Aurorus a few government secrets. Rest well, you fluffy informant. Next, I bring out In Play E. I immediately set up a substitute, and then Aurorus uses Light Screen, and that's the nail in the coffin. From here, I can use Encore to lock Aurorus into Light Screen, and then set up six Calm Minds, all the while being behind a cushy substitute. After setting up six Calm Minds, I baton pass to Equally, who gets the six Calm Mind boosts as well as the substitute. Then a very powerful Moonblast kills Aurorus. Gudra comes out fifth, but another Moonblast kills that too. 
And then last is Diantha's own Gardevoir. She mega evolves her Gardevoir, but despite looking absolutely fabulous in her new dress, she doesn't outspeed us, so a Shadow Ball knocks out Mega Gardevoir, winning us the battle and the run. Well, that was quite the challenge run. It was definitely on the easier side of things compared to some of my other runs, but that didn't make it any less fun. Generally speaking, the later generations have much larger regional Pokedex, most Pokemon have very good move pools, and there's a lot of very good items and TMs that inherently make those games quite a bit easier. Plus the fact that critical hits only do 1.5 times the damage in Generation 6 and on makes challenges significantly easier as well. Still, there were more than enough difficult battles to keep me on my toes, and I also had some pretty careless mistakes that made it a lot harder than it should have been. Regardless, difficulty doesn't directly correlate with enjoyment, and I had a blast playing this game again. Kalos really does feel like the most unique and most lived in of the Pokemon regions. I really like the art style, and some of the locations in the game are really cool. I'll definitely be returning to this game for more challenges, so let me know in the comments which X and Y challenges you'd like to see. As always, thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate the support, especially as I start to venture out of my comfort zone and try new types of content. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. And you should also join the Flag on HG community Discord, where you can discuss nuzlocking, make recommendations for future challenges, and access the trainer documents that I use for these challenges. The link is in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always double check that you're recording the championship fight.